This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. My perennial now tips to winning your NCAA tournament bracket challenge. Next on this week's edition of Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Looks deep for Anthony Cook. Waits for it. Nip Cook. Brady gets terrific. Turns it. Get it. Touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Kohler at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. On his way. It's good. He's 5'7", 179 pounds. A junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs the wall of him. And he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure from second. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ronald Robinson and Michigan. We're going to win the championship again because we're going to play as a team. And when we play as a team, and the old season is over, you and I know it's going to be Michigan again. Michigan. I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's edition of Michigan Podcast. Later in this episode, indeed, I will lay out my now perennial tips to winning your bracket challenge. But first, we got to keep it local and discuss this abomination of a Michigan basketball season. 68 teams are about to embark on playing meaningful college basketball here in the midst of the madness. How many of them can say they have a top 100 recruit at point guard, a two-time All-American at center, and two other kids that might be first-round picks in this year's NBA draft. I'll tell you how many. Not many is the answer, actually. We do, though. We do. And despite those things, we won't be playing meaningful basketball in the month of March. We'll be in the not-invited tournament, which shouldn't even exist. The NIT is an un-American concept. There is no other sport where there is some mediocre bracket for teams that weren't good enough to make the actual playoff. It just shouldn't exist, should not happen. Uh, Mad props to North Carolina and Cincinnati, who both said, yeah, that's beneath the dignity of our programs. We're not playing in it. That's the stuff of leaders and best right there. Not, yes, let's you know draw flies for a home game against Toledo that nobody wants to watch and our kids probably don't want to play in. I mean, if you, they played in Chicago like they didn't want to play any more basketball. So when you actually had a chance to do something meaningful still, if you were playing then like you didn't want to play anymore, I can't even imagine how you're going to play in the trash NIT. But that's been par for the course. This has been a, a terrible season of basketball to watch. Everything that we have seen at times become issues in the Juwan Howard era. All of that came to a head this year. Substitution patterns. How many, I mean, how many more fours are we going to recruit? I mean, guys recruited like 11 of them. None of them have been any good. The four spot, we played four on five every night. The four spot was a zero every single night. I mean, go back, go back and watch what Indiana did in the second half down the stretch when it came back. It just decided we're going to let whoever, whoever's playing four gets, gets to do whatever they want. We're not even going to guard them. That's what they did. They were smart. The roster construction, the substitution patterns, out of timeouts. Is there a program in the country that you are more confident out of a timeout in a key clutch situation will end up with nothing but a 40-foot heave than Michigan? He just, he even admits, he even tells us now, well, you know, I try to get him to do something else. They just went out and did their own thing. 
He cannot get teams to execute down the stretch. He has one and 12. Juwan is one and 12, one and 12 in games decided by one possession in his career at Michigan, one and 12. Scott Frost called and said, man, don't blow so many close one possession games. Take away one weekend last year where he upset Tennessee, coached by a guy that's known for early NCAA tournament exits, Rick Barnes. Take that weekend away in the last couple of years here where all of John Beeline's players are now gone and the entire team is Juwan Howard's guys. Here's what's been produced since all of John Beeline's guys went away. The most losses by in a two-year period by this program in over 20 years. Brian Ellerby, hello. That's what it produced. The most combined losses in a two-year period by this program in 20 years. It's tough basketball to watch, watching them get out-battled and out-hustled. Hey, look, oh, wait, Jed Howard didn't box out again. I, I mean, this has just been a disaster. And I hate it, too, because I love Juwan. I've loved him for 30 years. I love his life story. I loved him as a player. I just don't think he can coach. I just, I don't. Everyone watching me right now or hearing this, congratulations. You have exactly one less win in a one possession game as a college basketball head coach than Juwan Howard does. You might be a mailman, a soldier, a lawyer, doesn't matter. You're about as good in one possession games as a head coach as Juwan Howard is. This isn't sustainable. So let's, they, let's play in the NIT because this is a young team. Most of these guys won't be back. So that's a dumb take. It's just a terrible season. It was a terrible watch most nights, an incredibly frustrating watch most nights. Over and over and over again, all these close losses. If Michigan probably just wins one of those games, it's in the NCAA tournament today. Nevada got in and ended the season with three consecutive losses, all to teams that didn't make the NCAA tournament. If Michigan would have beaten Illinois or Indiana, it should have won both of those games, frankly. If it would have just won one of those road games last week, it's probably in the field today. It didn't win any of them. It didn't beat Virginia at home. On and on and on it goes. But it did lose to Central Michigan at home. So there's that. Juwan Howard is absolutely on the hot seat. And now for something fun. Not Michigan basketball. Other teams. It is time to unveil my perennial tips for winning your NCAA tournament bracket. Why do I go with these tips? Well, here's the big disclaimer. These trends and data points I'm about to share with you have helped me correctly predict eight of the 12 teams to play for the national championship over the last six years. That's 66%. However, I should warn you, there were a ton of outliers in last year's NCAA tournament to the point that it was the first time since I started using these trends I didn't get either of the two teams in the national title game correct. So we'll find out if last year was an outlier. I suspect it was, or more of a trend. But still, 8 out of 12, when we're talking about the randomness of the NCAA tournament, that's a pretty good number. So let us begin. First and foremost, no team that lost its first game in its conference tournament has ever gone on to win the NCAA tournament. So this year, eliminate these 10 teams in alphabetical order. Auburn, Baylor, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas State, Kentucky, Michigan State, Providence, Tennessee, and USC. Those 10 teams aren't winning the NCAA tournament because no one that lost the first game of its conference tournament ever has. Number two, all but one national champion since 2002 was ranked in the top 25 of both of Ken Palm's offensive and defensive efficiency ratings. This year, that is just five teams in alphabetical order, Alabama, Connecticut, Houston, Texas, and UCLA. However, Creighton, Kansas, and Purdue are so close to the threshold that with strong tournament runs, they would probably qualify for this criteria by the time we get deep into the tournament. So you could safely add them to the list as well. For example, Kansas was just short of this threshold at the start of last year's tournament, but played its way into it by the time it ended up winning the national championship. So those three teams are on the doorstep. So I'd really say your national champion is probably one of those eight teams. Number three. In the last 32 years, only six coaches have won it all in their first trip to the Final Four. Of the coaches who meet the aforementioned Ken Palm threshold, three of them have been to the Final Four before. Kelvin Sampson, coaching at Houston, Mick Cronin at UCLA, and Bill Self at Kansas. So think about that. Those guys have experience and the trend. 
Number four, 23 of the 28 teams, that's 82%, to make the final four in the Ken Palm era or in the last seven years were in the top 25 of Ken Palm's defensive efficiency ratings. This year, that is these 20 teams, UCLA, and now they're in the order of their defensive ranking. UCLA, Tennessee, Alabama, Houston, Mississippi State, Kansas, Iowa State, St. Mary's, San Diego State, Texas, Northwestern, Boise State, Creighton, Arkansas, VCU, Connecticut, Kansas State, TCU, Duke, and Virginia. However, there are several other teams close enough that with a strong showing in the first couple of rounds could eventually meet this criteria in tournament, like Arizona State, Auburn, Illinois, Maryland, Purdue, and Memphis. Now, I should point out, one of the things you're looking for is teams that, that meet or don't meet several of these criteria. Don't just necessarily pick one, except for the first one. No team that's ever lost its first game in its conference tournament has won the NCAA tournament, so definitely go with that one until it's proven wrong. For the rest of these, you're looking for teams that show up on these lists multiple times because they meet an overall criteria that you're looking for then. All right, next tip. In the last seven years, 13 of the 14 teams, that's 93%, to make it to the national championship game ranked in the top six, top six of the offensive efficiency ratings at Bart Torvik's metrics from February 1st through the end of the conference tournaments, meaning their offense was, was playing at its highest level heading into the postseason. This year, that is these four teams, Gonzaga, Baylor, Arizona, and Kentucky. Why only four? Well, because the other two teams in the top six didn't make it to the tournament. However, Connecticut, Iowa, and Miami are only tenths of a decimal point behind those squads, so I'd probably include them in there as well. Number six, teams that rank top 25 in two-point defense and outside the top 150 in three-pointers attempted traditionally do well or overperform in the NCAA tournament, except for the COVID year in 2021 when they didn't. Now, let me quickly, before we go back to this, explain why that's the case. Because with so many games and so many different kinds of opponents, randomness reigns. Three-point shooting is random. One night you'll make 12, next night you couldn't, throw, you couldn't hit water from a boat, all right? Um, what is a constant is that I don't, I, I get better shots. So I'm not relying on shots 20 or 22 feet from the basket and I play defense regardless, right? So if I, if I, if I get a lot of points via two point shots, that means I can get to the rim. And if I'm good on defense means I stop you from getting to the rim that tends to, to, to stay the course regardless of the randomness of an injury or a particular style that you don't see. Like you have St. Mary's and VCU in the first round, their styles couldn't be any different, right? That's why you're trying to eliminate randomness. That's why this stat tends to play well. All right. Last year, tiny St. Peter's was one of these teams, almost made it all the way to the final four. This year, that is just four teams, USC, Houston, St. Mary's and Indiana. Notice Houston is showing up a lot. Keep this in mind though. This is the fewest teams that have ever met this criteria. Last year, 10 teams did, for example. This year, it's only four. That would seem to indicate, I think I wrote eradicate, sorry. That would seem to indicate more randomness than normal in this year's tournament, if there's only four of those teams. Number seven, since 2002, only 1% 1 of the teams to make the final four ranked in the top 10 of either Ken Palm's offensive or defensive efficiency, but then outside the top 50 in the other. Why does that stat matter? Again, too much variation. If you have a lot of variation, you're probably going to lose, okay? Now, Duke last year was one of them, but then got to the final four, but then lost. So this year, fade these eight teams from getting to the final four. Gonzaga, Baylor, Iowa, Xavier, Missouri, Mississippi State, Iowa State, and San Diego State. History shows those teams just don't make the final four. Too much variance. One night, that variance catches up to them in a single elimination, and they're done. So just like we've seen Houston show up a few times on the good list, we've now seen Iowa show up a couple times on the bad lists. Number eight, let's start with the round of 64 trends. 16 seeds all time are just one in, 148, one in 148. 15 seeds all time are just 10 in 139. So therefore, pick at least one 13 or 14 seed to win, though, because, because at least one of them does about 20% of the time, St. Peter's last year. 12 seeds have won at least one game 29 of the last 33 years. Last year, they won two. Nine seeds are almost exactly 500 all-time against eight seeds. Trends in the round of 32. 
pick all the number one seeds to advance to the Sweet 16 because they do about 90% of the time historically. But pick at least one double-digit seed to make it to the Sweet 16 because that has happened 35 of the last 37 years. On the round of 16, advance exactly three number one seeds to the Elite Eight because all-time number one seeds make it that far about 75% of the time, although last year just one of them did. Advance no team seeded lower than 11th because all-time only three of the 304 teams ever to make it to the Elite Eight were seated that low. That's only 0.9%. But one of them, St. Peter's, just happened last year. Good luck playing those odds two years in a row. When we get to the Elite Eight, advance either one or two number one seeds because 30 of the last 37 Final Fours had exactly that many number one seeds. Advance no double-digit seeds to the Final Four because all time since seeding began in 1979, only six of the 172 Final Four teams, 3.4%, were seeded lower than ninth. That's it. That's a 40-year trend. When you get to the Final Four, advance no team seated lower than six because only three times in the last 36 years has there been a national championship game with a team seated lower than that. But again, one of them was last year. So many outliers last year. Eight seated North Carolina got there. One seeds have squared off for the national title only nine times ever. However, six of those meetings have occurred in just the last 17 years. So keep that in mind. 33 of the last 34 national champions were seated fourth or higher. Obviously, no one trend should be singled out except for, again, the very first one on the conference tournament losing the opening game. So that means what we're looking for here are teams that check multiple boxes to either fade or follow. So I hope that those help you again this year. If you want to sign up and take me on in my bracket, when I put these tips uh, to good use in my bracket, um, go to Steve Day Show. That's the name of the group for my bracket over at ESPN.com. One bracket of integrity. That's all you get. One, one bracket of integrity. Steve Day Show is the group name at ESPN.com. We'll come back, wrap things up here in just a moment. This week's Twitter poll, we asked you, should Michigan refuse to play in the NIT? 55% of you are wrong. You said, no, Michigan should play. You're wrong. 45% of you got it right. Michigan should not. It's beneath the dignity of the program. Don't play in it. It's a joke. It's trash. That brings us to our feedback of the week. Gregory Stewart says, it might not fit where you think Michigan should be, but extending the season to improve is worthwhile. No, it's not. Uh, there's nothing to be gained by playing a bunch of also rans and most of this roster won't be back next year. So I, God bless you, but that's wrong. All right. That'll do it for this week's episode. Don't forget to like rate, subscribe, five-star review, share, follow, etc. Whether you're watching here on YouTube or listening on iTunes or elsewhere, please help us to find more Michigan fans just like you, please. You can also follow us on Twitter at Michigan podcast in between episodes as well. I think that's it. Until the next time, I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.